Um, let me say that this is the first in a series of um, online seminars that the Institute of Commonwealth Studies is co-hosting with the Royal Commonwealth Society in Toronto. And we're, we're really excited to be, to be working with the R RCS in Toronto over this. And uh, of course, this has all um, uh, at least partly been um, the result of the, uh, as all getting to used to using online technologies for our events. And it's opened up huge opportunities, particularly for an institute which claims to have a Commonwealth wide remit to be able to connect scholars and, and politicians and activists around the Commonwealth in this way is, is, is fantastic. So um, uh, Colin Sandara, who has, has from the Royal Commonwealth Society was responsible for the idea behind these, these seminars. And I'm very grateful to him, uh, to, to him for coming to us, bringing this idea. And I'll just ask Colin to say, a few words of introduction about the series before I introduce John. Colin. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, my name is Colin Saldana and I'm the chair of the Royal Commonwealth Society of uh, Toronto. Uh, good morning to you in the, those of you from the West and good afternoon to those of you in the East in Canada and good evening to you in, in uh, the UK and the rest of Europe. It's a delight to co-host this event with the uh, Institute of Commonwealth Studies. It was my vision that when we, we here in the uh, Royal Commonwealth Society in Toronto, we wanted to show that we as a Commonwealth family of nations, we can meet together, discuss issues of commonality. And we were presented with this unique opportunity of having Commonwealth Day, which we have decided to call Commonwealth Month. Uh, which is March, and uh, to kickstart the program, we've got this excellent um, new form of Zoom, which uh, we are engaging with the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. We are also partnering with the International Association of uh, Political Science Students and the Commonwealth Students Association, all coming together to discuss and explore matters of mutual interest. The Royal Commonwealth Society is an international charity that supports and promotes the modern Commonwealth as a family of nations, linked by a shared inheritance of common values, institutions, and language. This Commonwealth legacy includes parliamentary democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and the recognition of Her Majesty the Queen as the head of the Commonwealth. So we are delighted that we are getting together and we're going to be sharing a number of uh, uh, experiences on a very important topic. We have an eminently qualified speaker who uh, Philip will introduce. But before that, let me introduce our moderator, Professor Philip Murphy. Philip is the director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and professor of British and Commonwealth history at the University of London. He has published extensively on the history of British decolonization and recently on the Commonwealth-wide role of the British monarchy. Since 2007, he has been co-editor of the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History. His research areas also include intelligence history, MI5 in the British Empire, and the activities of the British Commonwealth and US intelligence communities in the 20th century. Ladies and gentlemen, I present our moderator to you, Professor Philip Murphy. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Colin. Um, yes, I mean, I, I've always had a, a sideline in intelligence history and um, have long admired John, John Ferris's work. He's one of the people who's opened up this, this field. Um, uh, John is professor of history at the University of Calgary. He also holds honorary chairs at the universities of Aberystwyth uh, and Brunel and he's an associate member of Nuffield College, Oxford. Um, his work on the history of intelligence has culminated in this wonderful uh, big book, uh, Behind the Enigma, the Authorized History of GCHQ, Britain's Secret Cyber Intelligence Agency. Um, John's official history follows in the wake of 
Christopher Andrews' Authorized History of MI5, and the late Keith Jeffries' uh, Official History of MI6. Um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a tough competition, um, but probably GCHQ is the most secretive um, of the UK intelligence agencies. And so writing an official history of it um, must have posed particular problems. Um, but John has pulled this off and it's a magnificent achievement and a, 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 a very interesting and exciting read. So I strongly uh, recommend that those who don't already have a copy uh, buy one. It's, uh, it's really fascinating. And it, it points to an important aspect of the Commonwealth relationship, this particularly tight uh, relationship in terms of sig both signals, uh, uh, intelligence gathering, and the sharing of intelligence um, between uh, Britain, the USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, a relationship that really um, took hold in the wake of the, of the Second World War. Uh, and John, in, in fascinating detail, charts the difficult path by which that relationship was, was forged and the diplomacy behind it. Um, uh, so this is what he's going to talk about today, GCHQ, in this broader global uh, context. Um, uh, GCHQ, Five Eyes, and Modern Signals Intelligence. John, it's a, it's a delight to have you with us. Thank you so much. Over to you. Good. I'm glad to be here. Now, what Philip asked me to do was to talk for around 40 minutes and then to leave as much space really as you want for questions afterward. I'm going to begin by talking about my background in SIGINT and how I got involved in the book. And then I'm going to really look briefly at the history of signals intelligence since 1914 and spend some time on where we are today. Because where signals intelligence is today is very different than where it was between 1914 and 1992. And when I started working in this area, I thought that I was working in a highly technical, recondite area of acquiring intelligence for government decisions. Now I'd say that SIGINT is part of the world we live in. We as individual people live in a world imbued with SIGINT, whether we know it or not. And in the long run, I would say that the history of signals intelligence actually is one of the more important developments of the past century, a decade or so, in human history. So let's start with me, and then book, and then the history. Now, I started out as a PhD student in 1979 at King's, working in British strategic policy after the First World War. And as I went through the records that mattered to me, I kept stumbling across references to signals intelligence. And I quickly discovered they weren't supposed to be there. And I quickly discovered that nobody believed I could be seeing them. Even if I would bring photocopies of documents to people and show them this material, very few of them would believe that it was possible to say anything meaningful about British SIGINT simply because the government had attempted to weed or hide all of the documentation it had. And at a certain point, I got annoyed. I thought, well, I'll show you that I can actually do it. And in effect, not quite realizing what I was doing, I started completing a second PhD while I hadn't finished my first, which no one would be allowed to do today. And I published. From the middle 1980s onward, I began to write up material on the history of British SIGINT, which as it turned out, not only had the normal scholarly reach, but it also was being read by SIGINTers who were interested in history. And so I developed without understanding it or knowing it, a following in the pretty secret world of signals intelligence. Now, as time went by, I'd say in the mid 1990s, to some degree, SIGINT agencies started to open up. 
in the 1980s, when I was working, I knew a lot of people had been at Bletchley. And in fact, I knew a lot of people had been involved in various aspects of British intelligence in the Second World War. It was breaking into um, post-war organizations, which is very hard. But from the mid 1990s, it became possible. And the late Michael Herman, who died recently, was actually one of the very first SIG enters to become, if you like, public and to offer some useful guidance to people who are working in the field. And I and others owe a great deal to him. And as time went by, I began to know SIG enters well socially. They were willing to talk to me, bearing in mind, of course, that I had no security classification. But I can tell you this, if you're talking to someone who's in SIGIN and there's a security classification between you, but you're addressing general issues, if they're being open with you, in fact, you can infer something significant about general issues from what they say and don't say. Now, finally, around 2010-11, GCHQ had begun to open itself up to contact the journalists, businessmen, some academics. It understood that it had to be more open than it had been before. But a number of things, I'd say three, drove them finally toward deciding to commission an authorized history. The first was that a centenary was coming up. And like MI5 and MI6 before them, GCHQ understood that a centenary could be used to open up, provide some access to your history toward your own citizens and to gain their support or to inform them of what you really have been doing, as well as providing a history to their own people. Let me say parenthetically, the one thing I quickly learned about Sikinters is they did not know their own history. One of the casualties of this high level of secrecy is that they literally didn't know what they had done or why it had mattered. And the why it had mattered was the real thing they didn't know. They might know generally that they'd done this or that, but they didn't really know how it had mattered to decision makers. Um, the second thing was the Snowden disclosures. Now, both GCHQ and NSA have a neither confirm nor deny attitude policy toward the Snowden disclosures, but both the, Her Majesty's government and the United States government have admitted that much of the Snowden material was accurate. And by the way, we do not know whether everything that is supposedly taken from the Snowden disclosures and publicly discussed really came from the Snowden disclosures. I would be cautious in assuming that that is the case, frankly. Now the Snowden disclosures really struck a major blow at NSA. They, um, because American authorities were not willing to be honest with their people. Everything that NSA had done had in fact been cleared through appropriate governmental and congressional channels. There's not a single thing they did that had not been properly approved, but American politicians found it too embarrassing to admit to it. And so to some degree, they left NSA dangling. And I can tell you morale and NSA has not recovered from Snowden. GCHQ was luckier because politicians from all three of the major parties openly said, yes, indeed, GCHQ informed us of what they'd done what they were doing, we knew. And the parliamentary inquiries conducted into what had been done by GCHQ essentially said, what they did was legal, what they did was known. The reasons why they did what they did are technically justifiable. And I'm gonna talk about those issues later on. But nonetheless, Snowden shook GCHQ. Um, what had happened, GCHQ had quite literally one and one half lawyers on its staff. And their task was to handle local legal disputes in Cheltenham. They had like three media people whose tasks were to liaise with the Gloucestershire Echo, frankly. Um, they did have contacts with the Guardian, et cetera, et cetera, but these were much more intermittent. So they had no ability to handle the problems. 
And when GCHQ looked at the near damage that it had suffered, because what it was doing was hard to explain to people, it decided that it needed to be more open in order to survive politically. Now, finally, GCHQ by around 2010 to 15 was realizing that it was much, much more operating in the open than it had ever done before. Its consumer once had been entirely government agencies receiving secret briefings. Now its consumer was the British public. And the National Cybersecurity Center, in fact, had to operate openly if it was going to have the effect it was supposed to have to help British businesses, individual British people, British society deal with cyber threats, whether from terrorists, criminals, um, foreign businessmen. And for all of these reasons, GCHQ decided to commission an authorized history. Now, for those of you who don't know, the difference between an authorized history and an official history is that with an official history, every organization and person that is mentioned in the history has to have an opportunity to express their views and you can make that process last forever. In an authorized history, you do ask other people to state their views, but they have less ability to stop something from being written. And that's true with the old classic official histories. Um, it would be very hard to write an official history. They approached me because I would say that there were very few people doing SIGINT history in the world. It might, it, might have been, it might have been 10, let's put it that way, who really had a grasp of the technicalities. I was one of them. Beyond that, I was one of the very few historians who tried to address the so what question, which is to say, once you've got this material, who cares? What do you do with it? What can't you do with it? And because I'd spent a great deal of time looking at how British politicians, generals, diplomats used intelligence and SIGINT, in effect, I, was the, I had greater capabilities in the area than anyone else GCHQ thought it could find. And so that's why they went for me, a Canadian. And it also was essential that I came from a Five Eyes country. If I'd been French or German, they could not have offered me to gay. But being Canadian, they could. Now, the arrangements we made were this. They would give me access to a lot of things, but no access to others, and they didn't even want me to talk about it, really. So I was specifically denied access to any diplomatic communications intelligence after August 1945, despair embarrassing. Although in fact, if any of you go through the, the academic literature, you'll find a lot has been written on those topics. I was not to write about the technicalities of cryptanalysis, not to be frank that I could have understood them particularly well, but there was a real, I desire not to spill any technical beans, not to talk about anything that had current technical applicability. And here, let me simply say, there are lots of techniques that are being used in the middle Cold War that are still being used today, which GCHQ and NSA would like to keep secret as far as they can. Um, one person I was interviewed by last week, who is the MSNBC's um, Security and Signals Intelligence and Intelligence uh, Editor, a, a guy with 20 years experience in NSA said to me, well, when I read your book, I could immediately see what you weren't being allowed to talk about. And that's true. There's a lot that I wasn't able to talk about and I don't mind either to be frank. I had a lot to talk about and I certainly do not want to compromise techniques that are useful against threats in a real world that is filled with threats. Um, Finally, I had to know that everything I wrote would be subject to what intelligence services call issues of equities. So if GCHQ and another agency cooperate in collecting something, that other agency has to be asked if it will be willing to let its part of the story be known. They're free to write themselves out. They weren't able to stop me from talking about what GCHQ did but they could say, we weren't involved. And I will say to you, lots of agencies did that. Fortunately, and this is the main thing, the National Security Agency had agreed in advance that they would 
be as helpful as they could in clearing whatever I wrote, and they did. They actually made my history their number one priority for several months in their pre-publication process. And although they took a fair amount out, mostly on technical issues, they did go out of their way to make sure the GCHQ could have its story told. So that's where we stand. I had complete freedom to write what I wanted in terms of the material I saw. There were certain areas which were off limits and that's just the way things go. I will say the GCHQ lived up to its bargain. And indeed, as time went by, they gave me more material than they promised. And in particular, the code breaking side of the house, the Crippies, didn't want to be written out of the story. And so they gave me access to some of what they'd done and given me the ch even the chance to interview some of them so that I could tell parts of their story, the non-technical parts. So in fact, I think that one of the strengths of the book is that it comes closely to talking about what um, crypt analysts do in the Cold War than anyone else has been able to say. And I'd say that there's some useful material there. So what you've got in my book then is a, an account which goes back really to 1914, although I do start in the 1880s. It goes up until 2020. Up until 1992, it rests on a very large portion of the documentation available to GCHQ or to its consumers. From 1992 onward, it is rests largely on the basis of interviews, which I had to treat as deep background, and access to everything in the public domain. And I would also say, simply talking to people, I knew some of the things I should be looking at. But I will say that once we get to 1992 to the end, it's there because I'm trying to show that things don't end at the conclusion of the Cold War, and because I want to show that things change, and that it's really important that we know how those changes occur. But the last chapter, on the one hand, is the one that I'd most like people to read. On the other hand, I also have to say that it's the one which is the least thoroughly documented. One final point, I'll make it clear from the start. I don't think that SIGINT is bad. I don't think that it's particularly immoral. I think in fact that collecting signals intelligence, certainly through up to the end of the Cold War, is much less morally problematical than collecting it through human sources. But if you don't believe that collecting SIGINT is a tolerable or a good thing, you're not going to like what I have to say. And there have been two or three spectacularly bad reviews of the book all of which come from people who believe that SIGINT is a horrible thing and that I'm a monster for not talking about how terrible it is. Well, go read the people who've written rad reviews and you'll find out how terrible it is. I'm interested in talking about what happened and why. And so now let me look at how it starts. SIGINT begins with the First World War. Before the First World War, the components of SIGINT are there by which I mean the ability to intercept radio or cable messages, the practices of cryptanalysis, but no one puts them together. It's really only when the war breaks out that people suddenly realize, holy hell, we're picking up all this radio traffic from other people. Uh, we can write it down. If it's in code, we can try to break it because we do know techniques of code breaking. And every government has some, however low level of cryptanalytic capability, even if it's just one or two officers who are amateurs in the process. And Britain is in the middle of the road in these areas. It has a great ability to intercept radio, but doesn't fully understand how hard it's going to be to make sense of it. It does have some experienced code breakers already, especially in the army. And above all else, it has a far more sophisticated approach toward information processing than any other government in the world. So it ranges from being, say, number four in diplomatic code breaking in the world in 1913, maybe number two in military code breaking, but number one when it comes to information processing. Now, what happens in the first few weeks of the First World War is that every government that's fighting the war starts to practice SIGINT. And they rapidly come to realize that SIGINT, along with aerial reconnaissance, 
are new sources of intelligence that give you things that intelligence never could do before in a war. And of those two no new sources, SIGINT is far and away the more powerful. I spent a lot of time talking about the First World War, partly because I want to show how rapidly uh, the basic uh, techniques of SIGINT developed. So by the spring of 1915, the British appear to be the world's first practitioners of what's called traffic analysis. Traffic analysis simply means you're not able to break the content of messages, but you are able to reconstruct the pattern of communications from which in turn you can determine things like who's talking to who, how to command nets work. Now, by the way, traffic analysis is the fundamental basis for modern signals intelligence. When you read about how SIGINT is practiced today, when people are going through the billions of net, I'll talk about how this works later, of IP addresses that they can assess at any one point, the techniques are those derived from traffic analysis. Um, in the First World War, the War Trade Intelligence Department, which is the British organization collecting intelligence for blockade purposes, the best intelligence service of the war and one that's fundamental to the blockade. The British receive about 1 billion, and I repeat, 1 billion cable, wireless, and letter intercepts in the course of the war. This is unbelievably large as a number. No intelligence agency, no bureau anywhere on earth has tried to handle this amount of material. Most of it comes from letters. And that's actually very important when you're dealing with economic blockade. These are letters from foreigners that the British pick up through seamen. Now the War Trade Intelligence Department creates a means. Um, it, it's organized by leading British academic information processes, uh, primarily an historian and economist and an economist. But they're able to come up with means by which you can strip out the essential facts from every message, put them on a card index, set up alphabetically, and make it possible for any person who's interested in all the information you have on a specific neutral person or firm. And within two hours, what you can have in front of you is every single message that you have intercepted from or relating to that person. And on the basis of that, an analyst can write a, an unbelievably well-informed 20-page memo within a day and have it on the desk of somebody who's interested in it. This is an astounding bit of information processing. And by the way, when I first presented this material to professional SIG engines, which was around 2005, they just about fell over. I didn't realize why they were so excited, but it was because they saw this actually was the historical background to what they were doing with collecting material on the internet at this stage. But in other words, at a very early stage in the process, SIGENTERS are solving very basic problems. They're really demonstrating marvelous capabilities of assessing lots of data and squeezing useful evidence out of them. In the First World War, I'd say that SIGINT matters as much as it does in the second. The main difference being that the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians are as good across the board as the British and the French and the Russians. Um, so they're getting gains from SIGINT or from intelligence all the way through the war, just like the British and the French, the Russians and the Americans are. Um, it's, you don't have the situation that you do in the Second World War, where from the beginning of 1942 onward, SIGINT works heavily in the favor of one side against the other. And what happens in the Second World War that's distinct from the first is simply that for a long period of time, SIGINT reinforces the capabilities of one side against the other consistently. Now. My book spent a lot of time on the First World War, the interwar years, the Second World War, and I did this deliberately because I knew for a fact that what was known about British SIGINT in those periods was 
problematical in lots of ways. It was missing out a large portion of the story. A lot of romance and myths had infiltrated their way into general knowledge. And I thought that if I was going to be writing about the Cold War and later, it was essential that my readers understand in a much more accurate way what was going on before. But in effect, I'd say that about 40% of the book goes from the 1880s until 1945. It's a much more thorough account, I would say, of British Sigant than it existed before. But almost all the documentation I used in that period was in the public domain already. And in fact, I knew most of them. And I, what I simply did was to use what I knew and had written or was planning to write to be the basis of this portion of the history. It's when we get to post-1945 that things begin to change. Now, let me just step back and talk about what we knew, say, 10 or 15 years ago, and then talk about what I was able to see. I would say that in 2005, our knowledge of SIGINT and the Cold War was very constrained. Um, and my knowledge today is constrained too, but not nearly as constrained as it was back in say 2005. Some material had been released between 2005 and 2015. And if you were patient and worked your way through well, a lot of the technical literature, you can actually understand a good deal of what had happened, but it took painful thinking. So for example, I and others like Richard Aldridge were able over time to suddenly come to the conclusion that in the Cold War, there couldn't have been an ultra for the Western powers, because had there been an ultra, we would be finding traces of it and what people were talking about, but instead what we were hearing from people and in the written records indicated that they were really relying on exploitation of far different material, particularly traffic analysis. But it took me and I'd say Richard and others years before we were certain this was the case. Now from around 2010, GCHQ and NSA slowly began to release dribbles of material and the biggest dribble they released was to come out with the basic material on Ukuza, which I'll mention in just a moment. But basically in the period before, I'd say 2015, very hard to say anything meaningful about the Cold War. Weirdly enough, if you worked on the many leaks which had come out in the United States and Britain and particularly through Snowden, we were better informed on SIGINT after the Cold War than we were on SIGINT in the Cold War because Snowden simply didn't release historical material, whereas the stuff he released or disclosed in 2013 could tell you a lot about what was happening at the present moment. Now, what I'm gonna do is talk very briefly about what I've seen from SIGINT in the Cold War and give you a sense of how it works in structural terms. And then finally, I'll turn for a bit to the way things are working today. Now, at the, end of the Cold, at the end of the Second World War, Great Britain was the world's leader in SIGINT by far. The Americans were strong, but they knew they were second. One of the key things that happens is that in the spring of 1945, the British and the Americans begin to say to themselves, what are we going to do with our SIGINT relationship? During the war, there had been bad patches in that relationship. From 1941 onward, the British and Americans and Canadians and Australians had cooperated to amazing degrees in SIGINT. And in effect, they were all part of the same organization and they trusted each other remarkably. But nonetheless, there were lots of areas of friction and nobody knew whether the relationship would work after the war. But as we hit 1945, both SIGINT agencies and their governments think carefully about what should be done. The Americans do a very careful damage or assessment of power capabilities between themselves and the British and themselves and the Soviets. And although the conclusions may never have been written down, 
we do know the Americans conclude that the British are better than they are, may well be that way for quite a while, and that having the British as a threat rather than a, an ally poses problems. And the British draw the same conclusion about the Americans. They conclude that they're stronger than the Americans. They've got a bargaining chip in their hands that can help maintain general relationships between Britain and the United States. And they also believe that in the long run, the Americans are going to get better and better and may well match or exceed you. Now, finally, the, the operational question before them is clear. Do you cooperate with each other against the Soviets? In which case you maximize your strength, or do you treat each other as rivals? In which case you divide your strength, you created a new threat and you've weakened yourself against the Soviets. And the British and Americans conclude that they will allow their agencies, their signet agencies to negotiate sub-national agreements that will not quite be treaties, but which will bind them together. Um, the American Chiefs of Staff in August of 1945, and this was first discovered by my old and late friend, Brad Smith, read a memo to um, President Truman in which they say, maintaining SIGINT cooperation with Britain is a vital national need for the United States. In a world in which an atomic Pearl Harbor is possible, we cannot afford to throw away help. And they make it plain that they need British assistance in SIGINT. Now there's no other area where the United States thinks that it absolutely needs British cooperation. But here, they do. However, neither the British nor the American governments want to sign a treaty. Because if you do, it's going to become public. If you do, it might be turned down by the American Senate. And it will certainly create loss of political problems. And they're also aware that the Pearl Harbor inquiry in Congress is going to be drawing a lot of attention to SIGIN. And so they don't want to get caught up in that. So in essence, what happens is that Truman and Attlee say to GCHQ and NSA, or not NSA, to American SIGIN agencies, go negotiate. Now, in effect, UKUSA is one of the two major diplomatic alignments Great Britain has entered into in the past century and a quarter that diplomats had no role in. The other was the general staff agreements between the British and French in the years before the First World War, which had some unfortunate consequences. I will say that the SIGINTERS and negotiated CUSA managed to avoid those unpleasant consequences. I spent a lot of time talking about how it works, and if you want to ask questions, I will. Let me simply say that there's a lot of hard bargaining. And it takes a while for the relationship to work really effectively. But over time, I'd say in the next, say about 1948, 49, um, GCHQ has in a weird way become kind of an American government agency as well as a British one, by which I mean it's on the inside of American decision making. It knows more about the most secret aspects of American policy and American collection of intelligence than almost any Americans do. It has an influence on how the United States develops its capabilities. And the Americans immensely respect GCHQ. Um, all the way through, I'd say to the end of the 1960s, the Americans essentially think Britain is far better than we are in this area. And they know they can't copy the British system, but they're inspired by it. And so one of the things that happens is that UKUSA becomes an effective means by which Britain and the United States multiply their intelligence capabilities. It also becomes the core of the um, special relationship between Britain and the United States. In the 50s, the special relationship is backed by the fact that Britain is a great military power with worldwide influence, which isn't the case by the middle 1970s. But GCHQ remains part of American decision-making 
all the way through to the end of the Cold War, although I will say that from the mid 70s onward, um, the Americans are often frustrated by what they see as, as British unwillingness to pay the money they need to keep their capabilities up. And the British, in fact, end up developing a policy toward intelligence, which essentially says, I'm almost quoting um, documents, we will have to ensure that we maintain intelligence services and especially GCHQ at a level which will convince the Americans that they should go on cooperating with us. So in effect, GCHQ becomes an important bargaining chip in the special relationship and Britain will not let its capabilities fall below a level, which will cause the Americans to say, we're not gonna pay any much attention to you anymore. Now, by the way, GCHQ today is seen as being a national asset. The government treats it as an asset for British national purposes with the additional bonus that it gives you influence in DC, which it does, believe me, still. Um, but in the Cold War, to a large degree, it's the last area where the British believe that they still have a huge amount to offer the Americans, and they do. Now, let me talk next about how GCHQ works in terms of intelligence in the Cold War. All of this was secret until very recently. I have not seen every document that matters. And in some cases, I didn't do th write down things I could have done. I provide a number of, of characteristic representations of the size of GCHQ or its budget or what it costs to buy things but I don't actually give you a solid table showing year in, year out how it works. I don't think GCHQ would have been happy if I tried, but to be honest, it wasn't really necessary for my purposes. Anybody who wants to have a sense of the figures will find it simply by going through the text. GCHQ becomes a very large organization, um, especially when you add together the services seeking agencies, eight to 12,000 people at various stages. It is an intelligence agency, but it's also a scientific agency. It's like MI5, MI6, but it's also like the British atomic um, testing system at Harrow. Um, it is a major industrial organization for the government. So it's not an intelligence agency like the other ones. It is intensely secret. And I have to say, there's no doubt in my mind that a lot of the secrecy was unnecessary. And coming out of the secrecy toward the end of the Cold War is highly problematical for GCHQ. It causes lots of scandals, which doesn't do GCHQ a lot of good. It is intensely centered on Cheltenham. GCHQ moves to Cheltenham because of a government um, policy that tries to move government agencies to the provinces, whereas SIS and MI5 would never let themselves be moved to the provinces because they'd be afraid they'd lose touch with their consumers. GCHQ didn't care because its consumers were so desperately interested in what GCHQ had to offer, and it already knew how to deliver it to its consumers, that it could do it as well from Cheltenham as it could do from West London. Um, Cheltenham solves a lot of GCHQ's problems in terms of um, staffing. One of the dilemmas you have is that you have a need for clerical staff with an extremely high level of competence, but you can't pay them that much. And so when you're based in London or for that matter, Bletchley, you're constantly losing highly trained clerical staff because you can't pay them as well as a private organization would do. But in Cheltenham, what you've got are a bunch of people who want to live in Cheltenham. Um, GCHQ is a great employer. And when you're looking for clerical staff, local school leaving girls are happy to be trained in the most advanced forms of information processing. Um, they enter GCHQ. They, when they decide to get married into the family, they will leave. And if they want to come back, they can. And you also find that GCHQ has a ser serious problem in the sense that it can't recruit enough graduates to meet the number of births in its system to handle all the stuff the graduates are supposed to handle. 
What GCHQ does, however, find that if you bring in local school leaver boys from Cheltenham, a lot of them proved to be pretty bright. And in fact, GCHQ actually promotes working class boys far more than is true of any government agency I know of in Britain. Um, and prefers them over graduates from red brick universities. Because after a couple of years, you'll know whether these young lads are good or not, and you'll know how far you can promote them. Whereas who knows what you're getting from a sociologist from some red brick university. And that's the kind of level of discussion you find yourself getting involved in. Now, the people who mostly make up the top rungs of GCHQ are university graduates derived from Oxbridge or the better old schools, including London and Scottish universities. But nonetheless, working class boys make it up fairly significantly to the middle of the system. And there's one working class boy, I suppose you could call him that, who actually makes it to the director of GCHQ. So this is a fair, and he doesn't have a degree either, which makes it even more interesting. So this gives you a sense of how unusual GCHQ is as an organization. In terms of providing intelligence to Britain, GCHQ is far and away the strongest of the intelligence services. I go through a lot of case studies, the Falklands, Palestine, Confrontasi, and also NATO, to show what SIGINT does and doesn't provide. What I show about NATO is that it's impossible really to break into high grade Soviet encryption. Although in some cases, the Soviets use voice encryption systems that don't actually work. That is to say, they don't cover all the voice channels that they're trying to cover. In which case the British find out you can simply intercept it and read it. It's like plain Russian. But most of what they're doing is just intercepting millions of radio communications. You have people who spend their lives listening to exactly the same communications from the same Soviet division in East Germany for 20 years. You're living within their net. You know how they're functioning. Um, you get pretty good intelligence out of it. I was surprised. I really didn't think that they would be as good as they were. I would say that if you look at the case studies that I have in the book, you'll find that it really provides a dimension that you did not know about, about the Cold War and military terms between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, and also in the military cases I talked about. And in particular, I demonstrate how without SIGINT, the Falklands conflict could not have been fought successfully by Britain. So there's a lot of material there to go through. Now, finally, we'll spend a few minutes about where we are today. By the end of the Cold War, both NSA and GCHQ were in some senses obsolescent, just like IBM was. They weren't prepared for the world of PCs. They weren't prepared for the world of the internet. And so when the Cold War is over, GCHQ has a lot of people who are no longer useful. I mean, quite literally, 25% of GCHQ's personnel specialize in intercepting high frequency Soviet radio traffic. When the Warsaw Pact is no longer a threat, literally you don't need these people in functional terms. And new problems are emerging. And what I spend a lot of time talking about is how GCHQ survived the transition to peace without losing a substantial part of its budget. It is allowed in effect to trade in economies in people who can retire that you don't need in order to acquire new people. It goes through a process of cultural transformation, which appears to have worked. In effect, what happens is the top third of GCHQ people go through a prolonged process of discussing with each other what they do, rethinking what they do, recalibrating themselves for a new world and trying to come to terms with the internet. And from what I can see, GCHQ is the first large SIGINT agency in the world to start to realize how the internet can function. And it's got several years head start on the Americans. And for what it's worth, the quality of GCHQ shoots back up again compared to the Americans. 
during the late 1990s and remains higher today than it was during the Cold War. Um, the dilemma for Britain in the Cold War with SIGINT had been you can't afford to pay for the large interception um, capabilities you need to say collect satellite communications. But in the modern era, is actually economically feasible for Britain to intercept a lot of material. If you think about it, Bude Cornwall has been the center of world cable communications ever since about 1900, as well as one of the centers for radio communications. And there's no secret here, the British intercept everything they possibly can from the sources. So in fact, they're able to collect much more material for cheap than they'd done before. And as it turns out, the quality of their cryptanalysts and information process is very high. Now, the dilemma that emerges, however, is this. On the internet, you cannot maintain the old legal restrictions between what it is GCHQ is allowed to collect and what it isn't. Before 1992, GCHQ did not collect material between one Brit and another without a judicial warrant, in which case almost certainly MI5 would do it. Um, GCHQ did not collect material from within Britain, but it was free to collect anything outside of Britain. Now, with the internet, the communications we're going through right now may well be being routed through Beijing. That's how internet communications work. Every packet goes through the cheapest pattern possible. And if Russian espionage in Petersburg is communicating to Moscow, well, that traffic might go through Chelmo, oddly enough. So suddenly you no longer have a simple means of knowing what traffic you can intercept legally and what you can. If you need to have a judicial warrant to touch any communication, you've just killed SIGA. Because you can't prove without evidence why you should be able to touch these things. Um, and there are billions, there are like 80 billion telecommunications events per day in Great Britain, right? There's just a huge amount of material. On the other hand, how are you going to come up with the fact that if you're going to allow wide ranging interception, that you will clearly be intercepting communications between one bread and another by definition. Even if you're intercepting communications entirely outside of Britain, they might actually originate from a Britain in Britain and be sent to another Brit in Britain. Now, what both the Americans and the British come up with are systems by which you are temporarily able to collect billions of telecommunications events. Automatically, what you do is strip all of these communications of any identifying factor except for the IP address. And you are not actually reading the content. You're just looking at the outside. And then what you do is make this material available to access and analysis by SIGINTERS. What they're doing is, is using traffic analysis. They know that a specific person they don't like, a Russian spy, a terrorist, has a certain IP address. They look for who it communicates with. They look for the other IP addresses it's involved with. And you start to build up a network of the organization you'd like to track down. Only then do you even consider trying to break into the content of those messages. Now, what that means is that, in fact, you're anonymizing every individual person up until the point that you start to process them, which means that you are preventing yourself from consistently going after Britain to Brit, to Brit communications or American to American. But on the other hand, you are touching them. And it's a very icky feeling for all of us to say, one of our agencies is actually touching some aspect of our communication. But in a way it's like, if you think about the mail in the old days, um, the government was never able to open a letter from you unless it had a judicial warrant, a home office warrant. On the other hand, everybody in the post office is touching the outside of your envelope all the time. 
So what I would say myself is that although we're in a legally dicey situation, it's one that could be cleared up. But what it means is that when you look at modern communications, the way that GCHQ is intercepting material means that it actually, unlike in the pre-1992 era, is routinely touching British to British communications. And the key thing is, can you find ways to restrict that? Now, for what it's worth, the American Academy of Sciences, the American Civil Liberties Union, two parliamentary inquiries, all have gone through this issue. And in the case of the parliamentary inquiries, they had unbelievable access to GCHQ material. The two commissions set up by David Anderson, uh, QC, actually were given access to live GCHQ work. They could see quite literally everything that was being done from the lowest technical level all the way through the pattern of processing. And his commission was staffed with people who knew civil liberties, who worked with intelligence services uh, from a somewhat hostile position. And their conclusion, again, was that what GCHQ did was within acceptable bounds, so they may have to redefine some point or another, but also that what it was doing was very important for national security. But what that means is that we're now living in a world where our intelligence agencies, in fact, could be like 1984, and it's essential that we keep them from doing so. And fortunately, I'd say the good news is that legal means do keep them from doing so. Beyond that, we live in a world where we're all showing our private lives constantly on the internet. We are making ourselves, our souls available to other people to pick up. Our real problem are cyber criminals and cyber criminals are out there in huge numbers. Foreign states and in the case of both the PRC and Russia, private organizations, which sometimes are corporate, are going after our secrets. And finally, in our own country, we are constantly having our data picked at by private corporations. So we live in a world of, so again, we're part of it, whether we like it or not. And one of the things that I think is very important is that we have a grown up discussion about what it means. But let me end with one simple statement. If you were to adopt the Guardian's perspective or the perspective of some people in the Guardian, and I'm at the Guardian East, I have been reading it religiously since 1978 when I first ran across it. Um, what you would be doing is unilateral digital disarmament. We could give up SIGINT, but I'll tell you who won't. The PRC, the Iranians, the Russians, cyber criminals, cyber terrorists. And so the, the world we live in today is one which is very different from the SIGINT world before 1992. And we do, I think, have to be willing to understand what the stakes are. But at the same time, I do think that we're forced to treat secret agencies as being like armies or navies or police forces. And also ensure that we keep them under control. And the final thing I'll say is the good news that I have found that law does restrain secret agencies in Western countries. So I'm fairly optimistic on that side. And I'd also say that SIGINTERS, in my experience, have a set of ethics which is at least comparable to those military personnel and perhaps higher. They have internalized our ideas of what civil liberty should be and they do not wish to violate what they see as being the proper constitutional order. Now I'm happy to answer questions for as long as any of you want. It was slightly more than 45 minutes, I'm sorry to say. Okay, thank you. John, thank you so much. A an absolutely fascinating uh, talk, so much to, to think about there. Um, we've certainly got um, half an hour for, for questions. Um, I'll start to, uh, Please use the chat function to, to raise questions. I see one has already come in. John, can I, can I just kick off myself? The, the talk you gave 
I mean, it, it reminds me of various elements of um, the uh, descriptions of, of, of other authorised and official historians um, talking about how they went about their jobs and the, the restrictions on them. I mean, right back to, to MRD Foot, um, talking about producing SOE in France, which I suppose was the first of the uh, uh, of it the was. of the kind of authorized histories, and and Foot talking about how he'd been told not to mention MI six, and so that was <laughs> a, a bit of a a bit of a problem. Um, but but one question. Um, and I have an interest in this in that I've just taken over a, a, an initiative called History and Policy, which provides a sort of bridge between academic historians and policymakers. I, I mean, there are many reasons to, to commission an authorized uh, or official history. But one, I suppose, is to provide information that might be useful to current staff. Yep. Um, now, I, I'm sure that both in your, in your book and uh, uh, you know, in, in presentations you give to current GCHQ staff, you try and make what you've written this history relevant. What would you say are some of the key lessons that current personnel can learn from the, the past of signals intelligence in, in the UK? We'll First of all, let me say that one of the reasons I took on the task is that GCHQ will be releasing most of the material I was given access to in the next decade. So with any luck, people will be, out, will be available to look at my analysis and arguments and say, Ferris was right here, or I don't agree with him there. Um, what I did was to follow a warts and all approach. So I spent a lot, whenever I ran across what I saw as errors or from modern perspectives, very problematical issues, I wrote them in. So I spent a lot of time talking about the problems GCHQ has with coming to terms with science and technology, especially computers between 1945 and let's say 1960. I spent a huge amount of time looking on the status of women in, um, GCHQ. In fact, if there's any single issue which I spent attention to, that would be it. And what it does is demonstrate that women had a relatively high status in GCHQ or British SIGINT before 1940, but that it tends to plateau and perhaps slip afterward. Whereas in the American case, and this has to do essentially with the fact that in 1946, the American SIGINT agencies do not have enough code breakers and they send out a desperate plea to anybody who had been good, who'd gone back to City Street and a lot of women in the United States who were good code breakers come back and then suddenly the institutional matter was. I ran across a couple of files on GCHQ and a color bar in the 1950s and 60s, and I knew I had to put it in. All I would say is that these color bars were across all British military security and intelligence agencies. I just happened to be writing about it in the case of GCHQ. Now I can tell you that from inside GCHQ, what I wrote about women and um, so-called ethnic minorities, BAMB, et cetera, will have a live impact. GCHQ is spending a lot of effort on what it calls diversity these days, but it's certainly trying to increase the status of women and its recruitment of people from non-white groups. And simply putting down how the history has worked is going to have an impact on how they think about themselves. I think that sitting down and letting them see what they have done for a long period of time where they've been successful or not is very useful because for what it's worth, they never really had a clear idea of how their intelligence had mattered in most cases. In the Falklands conflict, they did know that they'd done pretty well. But even there, I provide much more detail than any 
in these other cases, when I went over the NATO stuff, for example, my analysis is the first analysis any historian has done of how SIGINT worked in the Cold War in that area. And for people in GCHQ to see how they had functioned is going to be uh, something that they're very interested in. So yes, one of the audiences for me were professional SIGINTers. Another audience were students. Another big audience were people who were gathered around here, fellow academics. And then finally, the, and here it's more problematic, the audience of, of normal people who are interested in intelligence or military or strategic issues. Thank you. There's, a, there's, a, um, there's an interesting question first on the chat. Um, about the attitude of GCHQ to being regulated by legislation as it was in, in 1994. Did you say something about that? Yes, and I spent some time on it in the book, although I wish I could have, could have been able to say more. Um, GCHQ's fixation on secrecy erodes by the late 60s. Once it becomes clear that ULTRA is going to become known, um, GCHQ and NSA both realize that they're going to have to find ways to deal with it. And so one of the things they do is to commission the official history of British intelligence, a very good series of books. But part of the political background behind it is the GCHQ calculates that if journalists realize that Harry Hensley and company are going in the next few years to bring out these massive books, that it will discourage writers in the interim from trying to write about SIGINT. Um, they go on believing that they can conceal what they're doing even though they are aware that there are huge numbers of references to GCHQ and various open sources that could be used by um, journalists or anyone to say what it is GCHQ does. And they put up an immense resistance when the um, first release of the first journalists come out, um, you know, Duncan Campbell and others, uh, with very accurate stories of what GCHQ is doing. But from the moment that they realize that the Official Secrets Act is not going to continue to work, they then decide they're going to have to find a way to make a soft landing through what they call status. And in fact, the GCHQ is ahead of Mrs. Thatcher in terms of wanting to be an officially recognized agency of the government because they believe if they're officially recognized that will simplify their tasks. Among other things, when they try to recruit at universities, they can actually say who they are. Up until this point, when GCHQ recruits at universities, they can't tell um, potential applicants what it is they're really doing. It can offer strong hints, but it doesn't really have the ability to make it clear. And for what it's worth, GCHQ actually cooperates pretty fully with the intelligence oversight agencies created under parliament from the early 1990s. There is no sense I see that they try to hide things generally from the uh, commission committees because they don't think they really have anything to hide. They believe that what they're doing is justifiable and they believe they can explain that to the committees and by and large they do. Um, from what I can see of comments in the open literature by British politicians who've dealt with GCHQ through parliamentary commissions, they think the GCHQ and actually MI5 and, and SIS as well have followed the law and have been behaving appropriately in, in regard to those commissions. Now, the thing is that what all of these agencies know is that if you have a good PR image, it also helps you as an agency in Britain. And I think GCHQ discovered that its efforts to keep up secrecy after 2001 actually were part of the reason why it ran into the problems it did with the Snowden issue. So they are now all three of them 
committed to being as translucent, and I'm not saying transparent, I'm saying translucent, as they can be, because they believe that if they don't have the confidence of the British public, that they're going to find that it's very difficult to operate effectively. I mean, it seems almost that Snowden had the, the impact on GCHQ that the spy catcher of her had an MI5. This, this sense that, you know, if you, if you go for uh, obsessive secrecy, public information is only going to be released in the circumstances of a scandal. So better to kind of to, to regulate the release of the, the information yourself. Well, they had that problem with Duncan Campbell, who's yeah. an extremely good yeah. journalist. Um, and in fact, strangely enough, Duncan Campbell's mother was a SIG enter in the Second World War. Um, and what Campbell demonstrated is the GCHQ was going to have to recognize that if people wanted to find evidence about what they were doing, they were going to find a lot of them. Mm. And you were going to have to find ways to live with it. So fighting against Duncan Campbell was their equivalent of spy catcher. Um, the Snowden thing caught them entirely off guard because nobody, nobody in the agencies really had fully come to terms with how vulnerable their security was. I was staggered, I must say, by how badly NSA had set up his internal security, mm. um, that Snowden was able to acquire the material he acquired it was possible only because of a real incompetence. And I'm using that word advisable within NSA. And when it came out, the problem for GCHQ is it literally had no idea what Snowden had released. And as it turned out, a lot of what Snowden released was British material that they provided to NSA as part of their normal working relationship. And that made it difficult to come up with a strategy for handling problems. And there's no question that their decision to become more open was driven by a recognition that you couldn't go back to the old days. Now, by becoming open, that's partly commissioning my history, but it's also partly by simply saying to parliament, to parliamentary inquiries, in other words, not cabinet inquiries, but parliamentary inquiries, we will cooperate with you. We will answer all the questions you have. And indeed, I have to say again, the material that Anderson has given access to just staggers me. I do not know of I don't even know in the United States of any cases where the Senate Intelligence Committee has had such access to live SIGINT material as occurred under Anderson. So GCHQ has gone surprisingly far in a very rapid time toward um, being, as I say, translucent, not open, but translucent. Thank you. Um... Uh, Colin Sandana um, uh, says, uh, who would be the second tier collaborators in the intelligence area support of GCHQ and what kind of intelligence do we have in the Middle East area? Well, let me answer. First of all, if we look at the other members of the Five Eyes, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, they're all medium sized. And what they do now is different from what they did in the Cold War. They were niche players in the Cold War because you're dealing with high frequency radio and its interception. So the Canadians set up this unbelievably complicated system and alert uh, Northwest Territories, a SIGINT base in you know, pretty constantly 40 below weather, uh, which is intercepting as much communications as you can from the Soviet North. The Australians focus on Indonesia and the PRC. Nowadays, they're focusing on the same kind of targets that GCHQ and NSA do. And that's also true of the Western SIGINT agencies, like the Germans, the Scandinavians, that <clears throat> the Five Eyes deal with. There's a loose collaboration between all of them. And we, are, we give them more and receive more from them than we did in the Cold War. But the club of the Five Eyes is still pretty exclusive. And it is intended to keep secrecy as one of its tools against even its closest allies in Western Europe.
And the fact, you know, that <clears throat> NSA was reading Angela Merkel's cell phone traffic shouldn't take you by surprise. Um, Der Spiegel about a year ago revealed material showing that the Germans have been reading some of Obama's <laughs> cell phone traffic during the same period of time. This is just how it works. Um, as far as what um, is done in terms of the Middle East, these days, any communications from the Middle East can be collected by anyone across the world. You can collect it either by commsats or simply by intercepting telephone communications. The Israelis are extremely good at it and so are the Brits. Historically, one of the strengths GCHQ had, strange as it might sound, is a higher level of linguistic expertise than NSA. And one of the areas that GCHQ focused on historically was Arabic communication. And I'd be surprised to find that's not the case today. Thank you. And Gordon Lawson asks, I mean, you've uh, touched on this. What, what contribution does Canada, Australia, and New Zealand contribute today? Uh, are we seen as contributing value? The answer is yes. Um, the Americans treat the smaller members of the Five Eyes um, with respect. I've been the only civilian in rooms where you, everybody else is either a Canadian or an American SIG enter, including the director of the NSA. So I've seen how they interact and they really get along very well. The same is true with the Australians, but what has happened is Canadians and Australians have been forced to move out from the niches they pursued in the Cold War. And so the Canadians were focused like Germans or Brits or the Americans on things to do with the war in Afghanistan during the period of time when Canadian troops were in Kandahar. Um, Canadian forces right now are in Iraq and I'm quite certain the Canadian SIGINT is collecting material that's relevant from the Middle East. But we're now in an area where I have no classified knowledge and I'm simply telling you what my opinion is based on what's in the open source. Thank you. I, John, I, I've got a question of, of my own, which is it, partly my idle curiosity, but, but, but it, it may be of broader interest. I mean, we tend to think of ultra only becoming public in the 1970s with the, the ultra secret. Um, but a, a while ago, I used to teach a little, a little undergraduate topic on the publication of Kim Philby's My Silent War in 1968. And Philby, of course, you know, if you were, if you were prepared to join the dots, provided quite a lot of dots. And, um, but, but even more fascinating in a way, to, to slightly preempt um, Philby's book, there was a pre-publication by Hugh Trevor Roper, which appeared in Encounter magazine, which, if anything, was even more explicit about what Bletchley was doing. And I've often wondered whether, whether Trevor Roper got, uh, presumably, he must have got some kind of authorization to say that, yeah. and what the thinking was behind it. Is that something you've, you came across when you were doing the research? First of all, if you go through the literature carefully, there are lots of references to Ultra by the early 60s. One of the Indian Army's official histories of the Second World War, the one on the desert campaign, which I think comes out in 62, that's my memory, actually has two or three pages, which more or less are nothing more than saying, this is material the British got from reading German codes. And then they publish the whole thing. And certainly when David Kahn in the mid sixties was researching the code breakers, he came very close to, to discovering Alter. Um, he knew about Bletchley, he talked about how many people were there. He tried to be allowed to interview people from Bletchley. And he almost, but not quite got there. So the British knew by the mid sixties, things were opening up. And in fact, if you went through a, writings widely, you'd find a lot of stuff there. So John Connell's um, biography of Auchinleck, the Desert Campaign, actually quotes lots of cable communications 
between Winston and Auchinleck, which in fact are referring to code names for Ultra that are used within, within internal uh, telegrams. So there's a lot of stuff out there. As far as Trevor Roper, he would not have said what he did without authorization. Mm. And there are, lots, there are lots of these kinds of dealings going on. So for example, when I was a grad student in 1986, I mean, working on various things, I was going through naval intelligence records and discovered that without anyone being told, what they had done is released in at ADM 137s all of the files that Patrick Beasley had been allowed to use when he wrote his book on Room 40. And Beasley was given access to that, privileged access to that material because he knew somebody. And then the British simply piled them out without it, talking about it into the ADM 137s. I was the first person to find them. And I just about fell over because I found that in fact, there was a lot of British military SIGA material from the First World War that was now available through these Admiralty files. But that was the way things worked, I'd say all the way up until very recently. GCHQ and the Amer and NetSA both have steadily released lots of material from the middle 1990s onward. They're holding some back stuff back on highly technical matters from the Second World War. They will be releasing more on the Cold War, but they're not going to release everything. They have allowed things, I mean, for example, you may have heard in the news something called Crypto AG, which is a, the name of a company which essentially built, um, based on the old Boris Hagelin organization, which essentially built major um, crypto machines in the Cold War, which had back doors or which were deliberately designed to have weaker cryptography than they could have. And the Americans and the Germans and the Swiss and the Swedes and the Dutch in different ways were all involved in making crypto AG work. Well, the fact that we know anything about it is because NSA allowed that material to be released because it was going to go out in somebody's private papers, William F. Friedman. So, you know, the main difference now is that government agencies are releasing material with some predictability and they are sidestepping just these private one-on-one -on -one relationships to get material out. But at the moment, what I'd say is that we'll, I'd say that within five years, we'll have a pretty good grasp of SIGINT on the Cold War, except on the diplomatic side, which will be enough for us to carry it through to the end of the Cold War. Um, we know a huge amount from leaks from 2000 onward. So actually, as far as I'm concerned, we now have enough material to talk about the whole history of, cold, of the Cold War, period. And will you be will you be following that up in your own researches, John, or have you moved on to other? I'm going back to the First World War. Right. I'm doing a. I'm involved in a consortium to rewrite Arthur Martyrs and the Dreadnought to Scapa Flow, where I'm doing the blockade, and I'm also doing a long book on blockade intelligence. So there'll be two different books that come out. I might consider doing something on. SIGINT broadly from 1992 to the present day, simply because there's enough material out there that could be analyzed. But that's not actually a firm idea in my mind. I have many other projects which are much more firm. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge and your expertise with us today. And this has been a, a, a really fascinating talk. And I'm so pleased we've recorded it because I think it would be of interest to many, many people who haven't been able to join us live. Um, thank you so much, John. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, again, uh, I think the, the book is coming out in, in paperback. In June. Um, June, okay, later this, late this year. Um, yes. So um, do, if you haven't already, uh, get your hands on a copy. But John, thank you very much. I think it's lunchtime with you. It's dinner it time. Is.
here in uh, in in the UK. Uh, thank you all very much for for joining us. Um, uh, Andrew McMurphy has just um, put the details of the Royal Commerce Society of Toronto, their website, uh, in the feed. So do visit the website and see what the uh, the Toronto branch is is up to. Um, but uh, thank you so much and you, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, thank you john for joining same with all of you take care bye, -bye.